Well, it's a pleasure. While my, uh, while my panel is getting mic'd up, I feel rather lonely up here, but uh, uh, l let me not um, uh, wait uh, by introducing uh, the topic of today uh, in this panel on finance. We have, in my opinion, uh, already talked about finance the entire time. There is not one panel that hasn't mentioned from the very first one to the last one uh, the importance of finance. So it is about time that we talk about it directly uh, and to see what can be done uh, on the housing finance uh, side. Uh, and um, I see Bertrand in the room and Bertrand, my friend, has uh, in I can't remember, hi Bertrand, what year you said it, but you said housing is built the way it's financed. Since the most of the built environment is housing, uh, I still think it's rather uh, valid. Uh, so, and uh, it comes back to, uh, to Jay's, um, you know, um, observation that most of the housing is under construction uh, in Africa uh, because it is not financed up front and people have to finance over time. It's not just a matter of uh, claiming your land and property. No, it is also a matter that you don't have access to finance. So finance is critical. It is critical in many dimensions of the housing market and um, particularly uh, on the demand side. Uh, housing, um, of course, you need finance in order to buy a house, whether it is an existing or a new house, you need finance up front to buy that house, pay for it now, uh, and begin to live in it right away. And that is the beauty of finance. You can live in it now. And you can even transact that house while you're paying back your loan. So this is uh, why finance is so important. It puts people into housing or improved housing um, right away because they now have access uh, to finance. So it expands the demand for housing enormously and it is very critical in that. Now, when you are dependent on finance to do that, of course, interest rates and loan terms are uh, critical determinants of that affordability. And like we are now experiencing, we are back um, to inflationary times, um, which puts enormous stress on the good run that we have had now so far um, when inflation was much lower, even in emerging markets. And finance was more accessible and therefore affordability could be expanded. Now with inflation being an, a factor uh, that we cannot control um, and that is really playing havoc with all the group progress that we have made over the years to make um, housing finance more available and therefore uh, housing more affordable. Enormous important on the demand side. On the demand side, f I want to say one other thing and that is that the demand for housing, not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in many continents, um, that demand is not homogeneous. It's very heterogeneous. We have very poor people. We have middle income people that are not served. The underserved is in many continents a very large group. And so we do not only need mortgage finance. We need all kinds of finance. Uh, we need finance for upgrading, uh, for gradual improvement of homes. And then, yes, we need very badly the mortgage market to come down market. So at least the mortgage market can serve the 50th percentile of my income distribution. Um, otherwise, how do I manage to get um, the the housing market actually going for uh, a much larger percentage of the population. So on the demand side, very important, finance is critical, and the diversity of access to different types of finance, critical. On the supply side, of course, we need finance um, because um, the developers, and importantly, we need to 
also think about investors in uh, rental housing, very important. Um, so we need on the supply side, shorter term, investor capital. Not easy in most countries. Banks being very reluctant to make developer um, project finance available. So on the supply side, to open up the finance market is critical as well. And developers will simply not build, even if they have access to finance, they will not build for a market where there's no uh, mortgage attached, where there is no m mortgage available for the people that buy the houses. Developers will only build if they can sell the house directly for cash or to people with a mortgage. Uh, otherwise, they will not serve that segment. There's no way they can do that. So both on the demand and the supply side, uh, housing finance uh, is critical. Housing f mortgage systems particularly um, are, of course, growing with the GDP of a country. So um, in uh, poor countries, the mortgage sector is very small. And we can debate, like we did with urbanization and GDP, what is chicken, what is egg. Um, it is affordability. It is a lot of different things. But the housing markets uh, in uh, low-income countries uh, are very, very small. And they increase in size with the GDP of countries. So that puts a lot of pressure uh, on the countries like particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, where indeed you are urbanizing very rapidly, but your mortgage system and your microfinance system, for that matter, are very small. So how then do you get people into housing now and pay over time? That is an enormous challenge. Within that larger framework of housing um, mortgage markets growing with the GDP of a country, um, it, there is enormous variability uh, and noise in that system, particularly in the lower middle income country area. So it is not so that we have a nice graph, uh, you know, a nice correlation going, not at all. Hell of a lot of noise. What does that noise mean? That some countries in the same income level do a lot better with developing their housing finance systems than other countries in the same income level. Why is that? And that is what we want to get at in this panel. My illustrious panel that is not here. No slides, no panel. I feel rather lonely. When we compare, for instance, Nigeria um, with Kenya, there is a big difference uh, in the size of the mortgage market relative to GDP. Um, Nigeria being somewhere at the bottom. Uh, and so um, what causes that differentiation, particularly in the, the variability uh, in uh, these mortgage systems? And what can be done about it, and what the panel is going to show, is that the first and most important factor is government policy. So government measures need to come in to help open up the market, given the macroeconomic conditions of the country. Um, of course, the central bank uh, plays the most important role by having a stable economy, your mortgage sector can grow. If that is not available and the central bank cannot uh, play a big role there, um, you cannot do much on your mortgage side. But given that larger context, there is a lot the regulators of banks can do to help banks come into the market. And we will uh, hear from our panelists um, no, there we are. So here you see uh, the uh, rather dramatic, uh, and the data is a bit old, because I thought of take, pulling up this data uh, last minute, and uh, I didn't update. This is from Hofinet, uh, from my website. So you see it's rather dramatic, and you also see how small uh, the mortgage sector is in low and uh, lower middle income countries and how that impedes 
um, the solving of the housing problem. See, in that middle uh, section of the slide, you can see how much variation there is. So this is both good and bad. I look at it as good because it means that there are ways that some countries can get ahead of the curve. We should learn from them to indeed open up these markets. So um, the government role, I come back now to my, uh, what I was saying, the government role is very, very important as a facilitator, uh, as a regulator. Um, supportive legal frameworks need to be put in place. The foreclosure laws have to work, simple as that. Um, and so on and so forth. The subsidy schemes that many countries have on the books uh, are not very helpful and very costly. They can be reformed. So a lot is in the hands of governments and we will hear about that from uh, our panelists. Um, but it's not only the government, it's the private and NGO sector as well that can bring in a lot of innovation. Uh, what um, India has done, for instance, through the private sector, um, by changing the underwriting criteria, being very innovative with FinTechnology to come in and allow underwriting of informally employed and very poor people. Uh, that all was driven by the private sector, facilitated by the regulator, but done by the private sector, so very important. Um, so I can go on on the innovations in mortgage instruments. Many countries have made changes in the way mortgage instruments are structured so that informally employed have flexibility in their payment system. This is not regulated by the government. This is all coming uh, from the private sector. And the panel uh, will discuss a lot of those issues so that we can learn from each other. And I'm particularly excited that we have such a variety of countries represented uh, in the panel from a very well-developed uh, economy like Korea that has gone through uh, an intense uh, reform of the mortgage sector um, all the way um, to uh, the microfinance um, uh, offerings uh, that Habitat will talk to and uh, Naim will talk to. So we have a, an enormous variety in the panel. So I will not speak anymore. I will just ask my panel to please join me uh, up here uh, and uh, begin uh, your conversation. We are joined, and I hope he is on, we will begin with our participant who couldn't make it because of our, our famous visa problems in this country. Um, and sorry, I sound a bit bitter, but I have, I'm so tired of it. Um, but um, he can join us now, I hope, from Kenya. So let me introduce briefly uh, the entire panel. Uh, on my uh, left first is Luvik Chikir. He is the Chief Technical Advisor, uh, Finance, Competitiveness and Innovation, uh -huh. World Bank. So that is a lot of responsibility, so we look forward to your comments, Luvik. Um, then we have Kung Juan Kim, a Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Economics at Sogang University, just retired, um, but um, emeritus indeed. Uh, and he will talk about the um, uh, reforms that have taken place uh, in Korea and that I find very, very helpful as a case. Uh, then we have Naeem Raswani uh, from uh, the Director, Global Finance Inclusion and Capital Markets from the Tarilika Center of Habitat for Humanities. And he will talk about microfinance particularly and micro mortgages, I think, even. Um, and then the person who is not in the room uh, is Johnston Altetia. He is the CEO of... Um, KMRC, the refinancing facility in Kenya. And um, we would like him to start with his presentation. And he is with us uh, in a video. Good morning. 
in a few minutes, I think I would like to highlight the housing finance situation in, in Africa and focus a little more on the transformations in, and innovations in the housing finance systems uh, in Kenya. My name is Joe Oltetia. I'm the CEO of Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company. Now, when you look at the housing situation in Africa, we have significant deficits in housing. Uh, actually, 51 million housing units per year. This is an indication that housing supply is unable to meet demand. The other one is in relation to mortgage to GDP ratio. Now, the mortgage to GDP ratio is low in, in most countries, and the low mortgage to, to GDP ratio shows that increasing GDP is not followed by an increase in home ownership um, through mortgages, and that is because there are a number of challenges um, on the uptake of mortgages. And when you look at the number of outstanding mortgages um, in 2021, um, a number of countries is actually very low other than um, South Africa, and the low mortgage indicates that primary mortgage market in Kenya and indeed in Africa is still in its infancy stage and obviously has a lot of room um, for growth. Now, when you look at the movement of mortgage rates in 2018 to 2021, you realize that there are significant variations in that movement, particularly in countries like Ghana, Malawi, Mozambique and Nigeria. And these variations are particularly worse in situations where the mortgages are actually variable. And in most African countries, these mortgages are actually uh, variable and it affects access of uh, home loans, particularly by the low, uh, the low income earners. Now, let me now just shift to the situation in Kenya, the recent transformations and innovations to expand housing finance. Kenya has adopted an integrated approach in addressing the key um, challenges affecting housing. And this is because the Kenyan government um, took housing as a key development agenda, what we call uh, the, big, the Big Four agenda. And this um, government took three key issues as part of the areas that need to be addressed uh, for purposes of scaling up um, development of affordable and decent housing. And those are number one, expanding housing finance, number two, affordable housing supply, and number three, addressing the housing environment. Now, when you look at the expanding housing finance, um, the key consideration was development or establishment of a liquidity facility. And this is KMRC, which is the institution where I work. The purpose of this institution is to support long-term lending activities of mortgage lenders. The key objectives is actually to provide long-term loans to primary mortgage lenders. So it's a wholesale financial institution and reducing the maturity mismatch among the primary lenders, which hinders growth of home loans in Kenya. Now, this institution has also managed to enhance competition and create a more level playing field among the mortgage uh, lenders in Kenya, which is a key benefit um, to home buyers. Now, expansion of the primary lenders to include circles, which is credit unions and microfinance has been one of the other key developments here in Kenya. Circles and microfinance institutions for the first time in Kenya are offering mortgages, which essentially not only increases competition, but also uh, creates um, possibility for a lot of people to access affordable home loans. Now, we use a blended finance arrangement. Uh, we are blending concessional resources and capital market resources that we raise uh, through bonds. And we are also addressing informal workers uh, inability to access home loans um, because they are considered non-bankable and they are unable to access the housing finance. We are developing a partial credit guarantee to be able to enable uh, this category of, uh, of bor potential borrowers to be able to access home loans. We are also strengthening public-private partnerships and now in Kenya you can actually access pension savings for purposes of enabling you to buy a home or you can actually use it for purposes of a guarantee, which solves up one of the biggest problems of essentially a, de a deposit or your equity to be able to buy a home, which tends to be a barrier to entry. We are also leveraging on partner institutions like World Bank and African Development Bank to provide long-term funds and also help in building capacity of the market and also enabling uh, home buyers by providing incentives 
which includes some duty uh, exemptions and, and, and mortgage relief. Now, some of the key issues that are addressed under the affordable housing supply side is where government is providing state-owned land for developing housing. They are providing the bulk infrastructure and also providing a number of subsidies, tax incentives, for example, uh, to be able to enable developers to, to, to be, to, you know, potentially develop home uh, housing at scale. And we have incremental housing development, which is now being run mainly by circles. And we have also established um, an institution, the National Housing Development Fund, to de-risk developers and act as an aggregator uh, of demand. Now, finally, addressing the housing environment um, really means that the government has been doing a lot of digitization of land records, titling processes, um, you know, registration processes and the rest. And this digitization has been ongoing for the last three to five years and also creating a one stop shop to streamline and fast track statutory approvals and reforms on the built environment laws, which addresses issues to do with uh, building controls and also uh, building uh, regulations. And yet, we still have a number of challenges. One of the key challenges we face in Kenya right now is actually inflation. Inflation is slowing down the economy, and uh, that means wages are continuing to decline, leading to a decreasing demand for home ownership. And also, we have increasing construction costs or materials, which means that development of housing, obviously, for the affordable housing range becomes a challenge. And also, inflation tends to increase the rates or the lending rates, which is becoming uh, problematic. We also have a couple of other challenges, including informalities and employment. Um, you know, the fact that uh, the mortgage lenders are, are risk averse, so they only lend to salaried workers you know, high cost of construction, incidental costs, and obviously the issue about COVID-19, which created a number of challenges in the recent past to be able to enable people, um, make it impractical for people to be able to access homes. So with that, um, I would like to stop there. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I look forward to answering uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, very much. Uh, I hope you will stand by. I hope you see me here uh, and stand by for question and answer later on. Uh, I would like now to go to uh, Naim, who will we begin at the low income um, end uh, here and then work our way up to Korea. But Naim will uh, talk about uh, microfinance. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, while going to the session, um, I've just realized that if, if we go back into the past, housing was equivalent to mortgage. And if it's not mortgage, it's not housing, was the general definition that we were wrestling with, particularly with people who were not directly exposed to what housing means. Um, and as we have progressed, uh, I would like to refer back to the Cornerstone Report, where we have got the authors in the room here that makes us realize that housing is there, but there, there are services that gets into housing, which makes its contribution to the GDP much more significant. Uh, based on the report, average uh, GDP contribution of housing and housing related services is about 13.1% in emerging economies. Through the course uh, of this discussion, we have heard a lot about the word microfinance coming up. And when we talk about microfinance, I thought it's equally important to be reminded of who the end users are. So if you look at a typical family in the developing countries, um, it's a family of around four to five members who come together and they're working in different sectors. Either they have a mom and pop shop or they're working in the agriculture sector or the child is working in a garment factory. And coming together at the end of the month, they have a family income of $500 combined. Does that mean that this family do not have their housing needs? Indonesia, as an example, or Philippines, sits on the line of fire when it comes to disasters. So it's likely that the countries are going to get hit by at least at an average of 10 to 15 typhoons a year. And the roofs would leak. And when the roofs leak, their assets within the house do get affected. And these families still like to improve and want to improve their living conditions, but they have to do it in phases. They save a little, they build a little. 
probably they would prioritize a roof over expanding a room, or probably they will prioritize adding a toilet to their house before probably adding a kitchen to their house. So it's all about what they want to prioritize and how they prioritize. Coming on to the microfinance sector, I felt that to, to get the understanding, we need to understand that housing does not happen in a siloed environment. It happens in an ecosystem, which is, as we heard earlier today from Jay, it's a combination of a financial sector coming together. It's a combination of a policy sector coming together. It's a combination of technology sector coming together. Giving you an example of Philippines, um, and that is where I started from initially. If you look at the combined trans clients that a commercial banking sector in the Philippines um, serves, they serves about 1.9 million borrowers as, as a financial sector. At the same time, if you combine the number of families that the microfinance sector and the cooperative serves within the Philippines, that sums up to about 13.7 million. The, the difference that usually comes in is the capital that they are able to disburse within the market. But at the same time, we should not take it lightly of the value of outreach these institutions bring to the table. Because ultimately, it is the families that needs to be served. It's the needs that needs to be addressed to. And everything comes down to what the repayment capacities of these families are. If there were enough income available, they would definitely be able to attract and go out to commercial banks for a larger tenure and a larger loan size. But if they do not have that, if they do not have the kind of security that needs to be put against a loan, they would remain unserved. So based on that, uh, the Terwilliger Center, uh, in partnership with the Microfinance Association of the Philippines, conducted a housing needs assessment survey. And we had about 80% of the microfinance institutions in the country participating in that survey. And the questions that we were asking is, how many of your clients are interested in improving their existing housing conditions? We are not talking about buying new houses. We are talking about existing housing conditions. And 88% of the clients said that in the next three years, you would like to do that. How many of those clients were interested in getting a housing loan from these institutions who were serving them? It's about 85%. And the loan sizes that we are looking at is $900. And why is it $900, even though it looks so small right now, become so critical? They wanted money to improve their kitchens, they improve their walls, improve their roofs. They wanted a loan for 24 months with an installment size of about $40 a month. Why did it become so important? Because the average product that was available within the market is for six months. So if you're asking a microfinance institution to move the scale from six months to 12 months, that's a huge behavior change model because then you're getting into risk management at that financial institution. Why does longer tenure become so important? Because that gives you a capability to take a larger loan size with a lower repayment burden per month. And that is the needle that was required to be moved within the market. All in all, what does it translate into? It's a $1.56 billion opportunity to go into the sector within the Philippines. And I'm not even touching about other big markets where microfinance really needs to be introduced or become much more easily available. Last but not the least, I wanted to touch base on another huge market, that is Bangladesh. 85% of the housing conditions in the rural areas of Bangladesh, and about 70% of those in the urban areas, is considered or is categorized as inadequate housing. Bangladesh is the pioneer of housing microfinance. But if you look at it, the majority of the housing finance solutions that are currently available in Bangladesh are more directed towards the higher income segments or the higher middle class and above segments of the society. So going down market, you're talking about a, a country which introduced microfinance, which is Bangladesh, 
where the microfinance sector is dominated by two largest players, the Grameen and the Asas of Bangladesh. But do they offer enough solutions for the market to be able to improve their housing conditions? All in all, the average loan size that is available within Bangladesh ranges from anywhere between 65 to 325. Sorry, that's the, the range. $65 to $325 for a six month loan product. So what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make here is the needs exist. The capital interventions are required. The bigger question, is there enough incentive available for the private sector to get into housing and to put it out as a business case to continue to serve the needs of the low-income population. Microfinance is not a silver bullet. Housing cannot be solved, or the issues of housing cannot be solved by any single bullet. We need a huge stock of army behind us, which has solutions from mortgage financing, securitization, capital market solution, technology solutions, behavior changes. Behavior changes just not within the financial sector itself, but overall the economies that it serves in. So that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naeem. Uh, Kung Huan. Thank you for inviting me over. Uh, this is my first ap appearance as an emeritus professor, officially. Uh, I just carried this title since uh, September 1st. We'll talk about uh, scaling uh, housing production requires finance. And I think Korea is a good example to uh, testify it. Uh, Maria just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, as Bert uh it's a famous line, which is cities, uh, actually, cities are built the way they are financed. Um, you can find it in uh, the journal Cities in 1984. Uh, that uh, short sentence says a lot. Um, Korea, back in uh, the late eight, 1980s, uh, until that time, housing was given very low priority. Um, and P Professor Henderson mentioned that yesterday. Um, and there was a combination of com uh, financial repression and rigid urban regulations. So they made housing very scarce and also unaffordable. Then came a regime change in 1988 when the government announced an ambitious plan to build two million new units over the next five years. Uh, if you think about it, the housing stock as of 1985 was only 6.1 million and the government declared they will add one third of it within the next five years. Although this is in terms of the number of permits, not the number of completion. But actually, the government exceeded the target, and by the time these projects was complete, uh, housing stock increased to 9.2 million. And this happened uh, within five year period. So how was that possible? There was, of course, an all out effort engaging all the relevant ministries and the public sector institutions, both national and local government. Um, but behind the scene was a 400% increase in the volume of housing loans and also the develop of land to support this uh, ambitious way. And Korea never looked back ever since. As you can see from the next slide, Korea looks a very different country uh, around this point, right? So uh, until that point, the average volume of new construction was around 220,000 a year. And then it went up to 600,000. And with a, with a few exceptions during the Asian financial crisis and then later the global financial crisis, the high level was maintained throughout. Now here is a snapshot of the uh, Korea's housing sector as of 2020. Uh, we have now 20.7 million dwellings for a population of 51.8 million. Um, it translates into uh, 418 dwellings per 1,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, you know, it's high, it's relatively high, but still on the lower side 
among the OECD countries. And the uh, housing investment uh, accounted for slightly over 5% over the past 50 years. And housing is a key asset, as elsewhere. The owner occupancy rate is uh, 58%, and the owner, uh, home ownership rate is 60.6%, the difference being those renters who own their houses elsewhere. Okay, the housing asset is three times as large as the size of the economy, and the owner-occupied housing comprises 45% uh, of household asset. If you include non-housing real estate, the total gets to 70%. And finally, mortgage debt outstanding is about 47% of GDP, which puts Korea on par with the European average. Except that here the mortgage uh, uh, is not entirely for home purchases. Uh, so to be precise, should be housing loans with, sorry, loans collateralized by housing. OK, so how did it happen? Well, if you compare the mortgage market uh, before the Asian financial crisis and the current situation, so there is a big turning point around 2000 in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis. So before that, uh, Korea's housing finance sector was dominated by two public sector players, the National Housing Fund, which is government owned, and the Korea Housing Bank, a state bank. State, uh, bank. So between themselves, 88% uh, of uh, all housing loans outstanding was covered. Um, and and their uh, interest rate was regulated, and therefore there were all sorts of uh, non-price uh, rationing schemes, including the eligibility of households in terms of income, and also the eligibility of houses to be financed by type, uh, especially it was limited to uh, new housing units. And, and of course, there was a limit in the loan amount per household. And the typical uh, loan product was 15-year fixed, uh, fixed rate mortgages. And the size of the mortgage uh, debt outstanding was around 10% uh, as of 1995. And Chunse, which is a unique uh, rental lease uh, in Korea, whereby the tenant deposits about 50 to 60% of the purchase price to the landlord upfront at the, at the beginning of the lease. And then the tenant gets the full amount of bag at the end of the lease. And during the lease period, no monthly pay, rents are paid. Okay? But it is also used by the landlord to finance the purchase of the unit to be leased out uh, later because uh, funding from the banks was uh, difficult to find. Okay, so the uh, Chonsei claims were estimated to exceed the mortgage debt outstanding uh, before the Asian financial crisis. And of course, secondary mortgage market didn't exist. Currently, commercial banks dominate the mortgage market. They represent uh, about two thirds of the outstanding loans. And interest rate uh, regulation has been removed around 2000. And um, typical uh, loan product now is uh, ARM. Uh, I think it's uh, in terms of uh, outstanding uh, it's uh, three quarters uh, thereabout, especially in the low interest environment, the share increase. And the mortgage debt outstanding, I said, uh, is equal to about 47% of GDP. Chun's uh, claim is still large, but it's uh, declining in its importance. And we have a secondary mortgage market, Korea Housing Finance Corporation, which is completely owned by government and issues its own MBSs and some covered bonds abroad uh, with their own guarantee. Um, but now we have a well-functioning, sizable mortgage market, but there is a different problem now. Um, when supply is inelastic, if you have an increase in the volume of mortgage finance to the, uh, to the potential home purchases, that could, that could jack up the price. And the government is concerned about this, and uh, they've been enforcing what they call macroprudential regulations, 
uh, by setting ceilings on the loan to value ratio and debt to service income ratio. Uh, and this is done uh, selectively in so-called hot markets where there's a risk of further increase in housing price. Okay, there are some milestones. As I said, interest rate was uh, uh, actually liberalized, I, I, oops, I think it's in later year. And the commercial banks were allowed to originate long-term housing loans in, in 1996. And the Korea Housing Bank privatized and then later merged to the current uh, KB Kumin Bank, which is the largest commercial bank in Korea. And the, uh, the current uh, secondary mortgage market institution, which is Korea Housing Finance Corporation, was established in uh, 2004. And you can see from 2006 to 2021, mortgage volume has increased uh, substantially. Um, and if you look at the bottom, the uh, mortgage outstanding to GDP increased from 29% to 47%. So what do we take away from the Korean case? Um, there, um, there has been uh, sustained increase in new supply of housing since uh, 1998. And this was supported by an increase in uh, the volume of housing finance. Uh, it was transformed from a narrow-based special circuit dominated system to a broad-based market uh, system which is connected to the capital market through securitization. And the volume of housing loan increased by uh, a substantial uh, amount, as you see. And uh, deregulation of interest rate was a big factor behind it. And also stable macroeconomic environment did help. Uh, in building the market-based housing finance system. Um, the, in terms of the loan product, uh, uh, ARM represents the largest uh, share now. Uh, so, so this makes uh, borrowers more vulnerable, especially in this uh, rising interest uh, environment. And the inclusiveness of housing finance has improved, but not, uh, not uh, uh, rapidly over the past 10 years. So we, uh, it, this is measured in terms of the uh, degree of uh, down market penetration um, improves uh, slowly. Now, the problem is housing has become much less affordable than before. So the, uh, the price to income ratio uh, used to be um, Around about five uh, for Korea and about nine in, in Seoul at the end of uh, 2013. Uh, but currently it's all, uh, around 7.6 for Korea and uh, 18.5 for Seoul. So this is incredibly expensive. So here is the uh, real problem. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, so macro prudential regulations are employed to discourage lending to the hot markets to, for fear of seeing further increase in housing price. But my uh, conclusion, I mean, the most important points that I want to make uh, are the last two. First of all, the ultimate goal of expanding housing finance is to help households purchase homes and uh, move up the ladder uh, of housing uh, over, over time. That requires housing price to stay within a, a reasonable bound relative to income. To make housing more affordable, we need to work on the supply side. Uh, so um, increasing housing finance without making supply more responsive uh, might make housing less affordable. So um, I, I want to highlight that no financial mechanism can make inherently unaffordable housing affordable. So uh, we need to work on both sides. And I think Steve Malpese, uh, a long time ago, wrote a paper where he highlighted two sides, the real side and the financial side of the story. I think he will summarize that later. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. If you permit, you know, I would like to continue the discussion. You open, Maria? Yeah. 
because now you gave me the rest of the world between Bangladesh, Philippines, <laughs> uh, 1% of GDP growth for Big Bangladesh, task. mortgage markets, and uh, Korea at 47%, a long journey, 20 years of hard work to come with new problems, new issues, but uh, so have the world, the rest of the emerging countries uh, in, in five, 10 minutes. But it's a pleasure to be there. First, I want to maybe to take this opportunity to thank you, thank Richard, thank Habitat. It's particularly important to see each other. You, for, after so many years of COVID, we have a bit um, sh lacking of this kind of opportunity to meet between professionals, people who have a passion. Each of you have a passion, expertise, and for housing sector. So it's super important for us to have this opportunity, and I really want to thank you for that, which gives me the opportunity to say that also with my colleagues from the World Bank here, Judy, you know, Simon, Olivier, Coudret, normally we should be able to resume a cycle of housing conferences. We had to stop, unfortunately, for four years. So the next one will be around the end of May, 23. So I hope to see each of you and many more of you uh, but then, hopefully, COVID will not get a ninth wave or tenth wave. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to honor our word to organize that and see each of you. But it's important to have this opportunity to discuss between academics, professional, um, etc. So I would like to go back to what you said, you two initial slides. No, we don't need the slides. Uh, but to say, to some extent, the picture has not that much changed compared to 10 years ago in terms of the difference between advanced economies and emerging economies. We still are sometimes putting that in one basket, but the problems are very different you know, in terms of accessibility. When you have countries of 40, 50% of the GDP of most markets, there are some type of problems of uh, for low-income people, social housing, but it's not the same problem when you, you are a, a prime minister in a country where your mortgage market is 1% or 2% still after so many years, right? And facing very dire fiscal situation, inflation. So that's important. Um, maybe to repeat that. The second is still a, a lot of optimism because I wish you would have a slide three. You had slide two. We well, remember if you've seen that very quickly, where well, you see for equal GDP, white countries, you see huge variances. The next slide would be to look for that, but every five years. I have that slide. Oh. Let's look at that. <laughs> Let's look at that next time. My point is to say, in some countries, both low income, middle and middle and high incomes, there have been incredible progression. We're well, still not at the 40, 50, or 23% like South Africa. But some countries like India went from 7%, 6% of GDP to about now, I would say, 15% as we speak in 10 years. We're speaking about trillion, literally hundreds of billions, not trillions yet of dollars, equivalent, but we're speaking about hundreds of billions. This is a big thing. And we're speaking about changing the life of a lot of people, at least in the middle income, moderate income level which is still a huge problem of accessibility for truly low undocumented income people. But progress is there, has been done in some countries. I mean, we have been working in the World Bank Group in some of these countries, and we start to wipe the benefits. Yes, Johnston, Kenya is only still probably 2.7, 3% GDP, but five years ago it was not even 1%, right? So on the trajectory, if Kenya can be in five, 10 years, at 10, 12% of GDP, it's feasible. Mm -hmm. It's completely feasible. So the question is, what was the key success factors? What is the trajectory? Um, so I just wanted to start with this a bit of positive tone, right? The second thing linked to that, we have seen my colleagues and myself a shift in terms of how housing is perceived politically in many countries. When we started with Larry and Bertrand, others, Bob and others, you know, the housing was something where people wanted to discuss at the policy, political level in some continents. In Latin America, I would say yes. It has always been very important politically for elections, for presidential elections in East, in East Asia, certainly as well. It was always on the top priority for China, Thailand, and others. But now we see this momentum, what I call the political momentum, happen in the Middle East, in Africa, in uh, South Asia. We meet some prime ministers, some, not just the usual minister of housing and urban development, right? My, that's my point. It's becoming also it's seen not only as a litany of problems, it's seen as a positive opportunity by minister of finance, by central bank governors, 
um, we do not see that only as a source of problem and risks, right? We see also an opportunity to create growth. In many countries, when we look at the mortgage market, sorry, we'll go back to housing finance market, but mortgage market is still the best asset in the balance sheet of the financial system. And by far, in most countries. And that's why, by the way, it's so difficult to revive securitization. Because the banks and others do not want to securitize their best assets unless they are really forced to because of equity or liquidity situation. And they prefer to use cover bonds and things because they retain the, the excellent assets on their books. It's a paradox, but it's still a very good asset, despite in Basel II, Basel III, Basel IV, or whatever comes, it's still the best assets. So that's a positive momentum, right? Uh, so when we're facing debate about you know, subprime, when's the last time we've seen a subprime crisis in emerging countries? I don't know, you, you'll tell me in the question and answers. Uh, for me, it's probably the Sofales Mexico. Yeah. The last time we had a major problem of NPL skyrocketing to 20, 25%. But for the past, let's look at the bit of the future because maybe the future is more complicated now, right? But the last point about the motivation why we had some good successes, it's a combination of factors. Policy reforms, clever, smart policy reforms. And sometimes the policy reform is not the next sexy, smart program of subsidies. Sometimes it is that. But sometimes the silent reforms, as you mentioned, we hinted for that. In some countries, have decided to, um, for example, um, out of court for foreclosure, making possible out of court Foreclosure change was a game changer for the banks. Uh, fixing the problem of uh, corrupted appraisers. This is not necessarily getting reliable data on housing prices. If you don't have that as a lender, you cannot operate. So these were assigned reforms, uh, sometimes fiscally costly, sometimes not, which paid off. The second thing, three factors. The second is probably the macro stability. Until now, we have been enjoying an incredible period for the last 10 years of macro stability, declining interest rates. We've seen countries which could even introduce fixed rate mortgages, right? Um, I don't know if for the case of not yet Korea, but this was um, unthinkable you know, 15 years ago. And the third, what I think, is also retail uh, banking competition. People do not see that, but there's been really, mortgages become really the object of competition in retail banking. In many countries, now in Senegal, Morocco, it's not for the sake of housing that the banks are going into mortgages because it's the best cross-seller tool to, to enter the world for retail, retail banking. So for all these different reasons, we start to have successes, right? In terms of products also, uh, which were really fascinating, where people were seeing attention, it's a continuum of different products. It's not just mortgage market for civil servants against microfinance for the ultra poor. We see a continuum of products between microfinance up to mortgage uh, with a continuum of players. It's not just banks and microfinance. We see also housing finance companies, cooperative banks. So the galaxy of products on, 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 on players. In terms of interesting, what interests motivate us a lot at the World Bank Group these days, we've seen success to be replicated. I would say guarantee funds. Uh, this is something more and more interests and successes have been recorded. Fiscally, for governments to introduce, to create FHA or CMHC of Canada in countries is not too expensive to capitalize such tools, and they can wipe off a lot of uh, multiplier leverage effect through the community of lenders. So I always like to quote the case of Morocco. I don't think we have the chance of Moroccan representative. But after 15 years, the guarantee funds, the one for only undocumented low-income housing, I'm not speaking, they do not accept people who are salaried. Uh, I think they have now reached 400,000 loans in 10 years, all of them undocumented income, mortgage loans. That's really remarkable. And the cost for the government was very, very limited. It was the cheapest, the best cost-benefit tool of a subsidy, you know, if you want about that. And so far, I would say, the, from memory, the sinistrality, what we call sinistrality, the number of claims to be paid, has been the range of 5 to 6%, which is really excellent for when you think about the targets. So we have seen you know, more and more countries developing that and replicating this model. We also see products like rent to own gaining, gaining a lot of, uh, I'm seeing, looking at my friend from IFC, because they're finishing a big study on that. 
there again, it has been sometimes a disaster in some countries, sometimes very good. In Senegal, Djibouti, we, we know some cases where it has been working very well. So it's a kind of hybrid between rental and home ownership to limit risk uh, for lenders, etc. In terms of concerns, moving to the concerns, of course, number one, I'm, I'm sure that everybody would agree with me, is the macro conditions, right, are getting really tense as we speak. So there are two different levels for the emerging countries. The sovereign spreads are really on the rise, brutal rise. And this is going to be having a lot of consequences on the mortgage markets. There's no doubt about that. You cannot avoid it. Um, inflation. And the big question for us, I'm looking at people because they, maybe you can tell me, the big thing is how long is going to be this inflation? That's, that's really a really big challenge for us. Because if it's, we know it's a relatively short-term phenomenon, you can imagine, and we design some countries, some system of interest rate buffers with governments to compensate, right? for three, four years, the possibility of a spike. But if inflation to stay, that's a very different ball game. So we're starting to think in some countries, the dilemma for us is, are we going to have to reinvent the wheel of indexation? But we, we had to do that in Latin America in the 80s, right? even part of ECA, Central Europe. Because inflation has to, the fiscal situation of governments is such so dire as we speak now, but you cannot imagine having to compensate you know, for huge interest rate spikes for a long time, for 20 years. So do we have some governments attending us now, like Pakistan, and I think, Maria, you are working with us, are thinking maybe we have no choice but to introduce indexed, inflation index mortgages, which is hell, frankly speaking, to organize. But this is the kind of questions we are wondering. In terms of uh, the big debate also, I'm just putting two or three of them on the table, not that I have answers to all of them, it's just to say what people are discussing as we speak. Um, in terms of uh, subsidies, I think I was a colleague from Colombia yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Ministry of Co former Minister of Housing. I like the way he formulated the problem because we have re-engineered another program of subsidies, which is, seems to be working relatively well this time, after many failures in, in Colombia, which is great. And he put the debate like that. And we face this debate in many places. Do we want to be very targeted, or do we want scale? That's a really big debate. Uh, the governments have no huge fiscal space, as I said. So if you want to be really going for the low income, you have to probably to be very generous per unit, right? You have to give between upfront subsidies, interest rate subsidies. You accumulate all the different subsidies. If you really want to help people, you have to give a lot. And it can be a lot can be 60, 70 percent and net present value of the value of a home. But then how many people are you going to serve? And how are you going to prioritize, right, to target? Vis-a-vis -vis for the same amount fiscal cost, uh, can you maybe scale up and serve a much wider range of the demand of the population, but not necessarily the, the ultra poor, especially given the post-COVID, the COVID and the crisis situation these days. So that's one of the big, big challenge. Not that I have an answer uh, to all this, but this is what will keep us busy at night and days at the World Bank now these days. Um, maybe I should say, I'm sorry, because you asked me, Marianne, I forgot. Um, two things maybe to finish there, my, my intro, and I'm happy to answer the question, of course. In terms of things which have been working relatively well, you asked me to think about the secondary markets, right? The capital, the use of capital markets. So in some countries, um, it has been really remarkable, and I hope for the best for Johnson in Kenya. Um, and we've been very busy uh, trying to develop some tools because we need a trillion of dollars at the end of the day, right? And it will not come just from bank deposits. That we know for sure in some countries. You can develop a system of housing finance markets, maybe up to 10, 12 percent of the GDP with bank deposits, or bank, not just banks, let's say deposits of microfinance. And, uh, but if you want to reach the 20, 25 percent or more, you have to mobilize the capital markets in one way or another. So this has, we start to have uh, successes mostly through what we call on balance sheet, cover bonds, um, liquidity facilities like KMRC and others, which we keep the risk very low. We're speaking about the ultra secure bond, the second best to govern bonds, let's put it in that way, right? And there's huge appetite, and we start to have success now uh, with domestic institutional investors. That's the, that's the limit. With the pension fund, the provident fund of the world, 
like these kind of papers because it's relatively safe, right? So it's relatively easier to convince regulators but to open up the investment buckets and this kind of thing. So this has started to be West Africa, say, Arash, and has been issuing now its bond number, looking at you, eight or nine, something like that, and start to be a regular issuer. So we start to have this. The borderline is to go to global investors. That's really difficult. Uh, unless we have some foreign exchange, you know, like Turkey did for the cover bonds, it's really a big stumbling block is to get the global investors, right, into the housing for emerging countries. For that, we need to, well, sometimes we do that, to structure a way to secure, to hedge the foreign exchange risk, because otherwise it's going to be very difficult. There are tons of investors who love to come to a housing finance and accept the credit risk, but not the foreign exchange risk. The, uh, the, what's happening also, see, we have seen the, the re revival, I call that with a lot of caution, revival of, secondary, of uh, mortgage backed securities. Uh, securitization has been quasi dead if you look at emerging countries. Even in countries where it used to be really uh, very developed, it nearly died after Lehman Brothers. And we see the first signals of uh, coming back. You need a perfect constellation of stars to make it happen, but it's happening. We, we see a lot of potential in India now, for example. Why? Because you, know, you have the housing finance companies, they need to access long-term money. Long-term money, you, you can go, you can get it in India, but you have to be double A. So the rating of these housing finance companies is not double A, but the mortgage portfolio is excellent. So you have the assets, but you don't have the rating. So securitization is a good way to, to think about it. And the central bank has uh, totally refurbished and modernized the regulatory framework, which was obsolete for securitization. So, a priori, this is the kind of place where why not? And it should have a, a good chance. My very last point is we see a lot of attention and requests in green housing and green housing finance. I mean, my colleagues are working every, every project, every project we worked in the World Bank Group, we are doing nearly every time work in both supply and demand, because you have to do both. You cannot just do one and forget the other. And more and more, we are asked to include uh, a, a green housing. But there again, there are questions, um, a lot of questions, because we see more progress, to be frank with you, in, for example, uh, in climate change project and finance for infrastructure than for housing. Yeah. Uh, we have many more projects in infrastructure where, you know, it's very hard for me to tell you why, but one of the questions is probably what is the, throwing back the question to the audience, what's the optimal uh, combination of carrot and sticks and incentives and regulations to really bring this sector to greener housing and greener housing mortgage markets? A central bank is not going to give brownie points of uh, regulatory capital just for the sake because it's housing, uh, green housing finance. So we have to demonstrate but the mortgage market is a better risk, for example, and demonstrate with data. But we, um, do we need for that some subsidies? Which kind of subsidies would motivate the lenders, investors, and the, and the consumers, right, the borrowers? So maybe I should stop there. I'm sorry if I was a bit disjointed. It was my purpose was maybe just to put a few questions back on the table and give a snapshot of what is, seems to be working a bit better and what are still the challenges ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ludwig. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, are there questions from the room first? I have a question for Loic uh, about uh, the impact. What we are doing, we are entering in a totally new world. Uh, some of you may remember the expression that central bankers used to use, uh, which was the great moderation. And after Jackson Hole this year, they said, now we are into the great volatility. Yeah. And uh, what I do not have clearly in mind, I have a perception that the impact on emerging markets is going to be extremely severe. Yes. In terms of uh, interest rate margin, interest rate volatility, in terms of employment. Uh, we have a food crisis, we have an energy crisis, we have a labor crisis plus COVID. Um, from where you sit, uh, could you elaborate on that picture a little bit, or are we all in the dark? We're mostly in the dark, to be frank. 
Yes, we are our forecasts are, are not good. The forecasts are absolutely not good. I've never, we have never seen so much crisis compiling one after another. So the COVID was terrible, but then it's been overshadowed by the war, the supply chain, etc., etc. So all forecasts are pretty are getting worse by the, by the month from IMF and the World Bank, you know, so you know that. So the impact on financial markets is, 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 is difficult. A lot of central banks are very nervous now, as we speak, for our client countries. Now, at, at least, interesting thing for housing is, is still we see housing as a relatively one of the best risk in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't say real estate, I say housing. And there have been several central banks during the COVID years which have put uh, relatively effective stimulus packages. People speak mostly about the stimulus package for SMEs because that's the one which costs mostly uh, you know, fiscal cost. But there were also some relatively decent packages for, to keep and preserve uh, the housing system because they expect housing to play a big role for the reviving of growth for the labor markets. So we do not want to let the housing markets get, get down because we see the potential for the growth, the revival of the growth. Uh, so there's still something where we see stimulus packages by central banks not to see what they can do to let not drop the ball on the housing finance market. But the, again, the big problem is inflation. If inflation comes uh, to some countries, uh, we see some countries now in the level of uh, 15 to 20 to 25 percent, more and more countries in this range, we're not in the range of 5 to 10 percent and longer, and it's a big, big difference. But again, the problem is the dark is because we do not know for how long it's going to be. Yeah, if and I, I don't may think add to you, yes, Luis, is um, the stimulus packages that were implemented during COVID, some of them, um, and actually most of them, uh, were targeted on the interest rates. So they promised several countries very cheap fixed rate loans for a very long time. And now that inflation hits, that is, of course, a major disaster. So in countries where Louis and I happen to work, um, this has been really uh, a big issue now. Uh, it's becoming even worse. It was never a good idea. Uh, but now with inflation, uh, that problem uh, is getting worse. And these have to be reformed, basically. Yeah. And there's a lot of market. The market is very nervous in many countries, Bertrand, because people... People, developers, lenders, investors, they, um, if you put a new program of subsidies, you know very well, right? It has to be credible that it would pass the test of time and political cycles. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I, so speaking about capital markets, you know, DFC could, we could provide a local currency guarantee of a mortgage bond, a cover bond, a mortgage security, whatever, in Africa, for example. But when we're talking to the pension funds about investing in these bonds, they're objecting to tenor. They say they can't, they can't match asset liability for the kind of tenor we need for mortgages. Pricing, they say what the pricing we need for affordable mortgages is not competitive with their other investment opportunities and liquidity. There's no liquidity for these instruments. So I'm curious to know with the successes that, that the panelists have had, how did you convince local pension funds to, to invest in these types of instruments? Yeah, I think this uh, is a good question for Kwan Kwan because the pension fund, the opening up of the pension funds actually played a big role. So if you could uh, tackle that. Traditionally, Korean pension funds were guided against uh, investing in uh, any risky asset, especially the stock market, and now and real estate in general. And then they now uh, they are moving away from that uh, stance. So they are getting a um, larger share in the uh, real estate-related investment, uh, both domestically and internationally. So yes, uh, a pension fund is a, a, a sizable uh, uh, investor in the uh, MBS market. And then we, we were, uh, the Korea Housing Finance Corporation was able to, uh, to issue some covered bonds in the international market as well. Right. Yeah. Um, if I may speak to Joe uh, and get Joe into the uh, classroom again. Classroom. All right. Thank you, Maya, uh, and thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, because yes. you, um, uh, Kenya, 
uh, also has done a good job uh, involving the pension funds uh, in KMRC and in the mortgage market in general. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Maya, and thank you, everyone. Um, indeed, um, pension funds um, are significantly investing in, um, in um, private uh, debt in Kenya. Now, I think what is guiding that is the investment guidelines that uh, the pension, uh, pension funds have in Kenya. So you have a kind of requirements the, that provide um, you know, the kind of investment classes that you need to put funds in. And a number of pension funds in Kenya are actually very liquid. Now, when you also look at the sovereign, um, they, they invest certainly in government securities, uh, but of course they have to diversify. So in the course of issuing our bond, which we did earlier this year, uh, we convinced a number of pension funds. Actually, the, the largest investors in our bond are pension funds. They hold certainly long-term liabilities. And they also look at the return. So compare the return, for example, to a sovereign, although sovereign, of course, is a safety. Uh, but they also look at the institution in terms of the risk that um, the institution carries. So KMRC uh, um, certainly is a low-risk financial institution, and that convinces um, pension funds to come in. Um, it is, you know, um, slightly higher than a sovereign, of course, but the return is also higher. So we, we provide um, um, a, a slightly higher return. Um, the return that we provided, um, the rate that, that came in, that we gave was actually about 90 basis points above above the sovereign. So it's a combination of things. It's not merely the return um, and, and, and not just the, the guidelines, but there is also um, an appreciation by the pension funds on the need um, for housing. And therefore the investment in housing, of course, is based on the understanding that housing is a low risk asset and, 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 and therefore uh, they, they are convinced that they need to support the country to develop housing. Maybe I'm misremembering, but when that, they were tried in Latin America, it's a way to deal with inflation. They didn't work very well, did they? I mean, there were huge performance issues and so on, or am I not remembering that correctly? I mean, are, are they really a viable response if we do go into an inflationary environment? In, in the 80s, there was really no other choices for Latin America at, at that time. I mean, to be frank, you know, when you're living in a world of inflation 30, 40%, you know, you either you don't do long-term finance in local currency or you indexed. No. No, it's as simple as that, because it makes no sense to do long-term finance. It's not just housing, by the way. So the best example of, in terms of what worked, it was, it, it, I said, it raised challenges, right? It's not easy. When you have negative amortization, you have to have a whole system. Yes, yes. You, you need to have all the liabilities also indexed. You have to have a whole system on long-term funds working well, and it's not easy at all. At the end of the day, you, your big risk you face to make the to macro risk is the fact that the income of the population, the borrowers, will not keep pace with inflation. It's as simple as that. If you can manage that, you can deal it. So there were success and failures. Probably, I speak and the people who are more experienced than me on that, but I remember that Chile did pretty well. The problem for Chile, they have developed a very big housing fund system, all indexed on UF, right, which is what the unit. The biggest problem was to live without it to get rid of that <laughs> when, because people took bad habits to, and then when you go back to normal macro situation, you have to get rid of that. Mexico did relatively well because they put a guarantee fund, a macro risk fund, and I remember Baton did that, uh, to cover for the, the macro risk that there could be a shock between income and inflation, right? We didn't have to use it, but it worked relatively well. Argentina did not do very well. <laughs> And Brazil and others, you know, they had problems. Colombia had a big problem uh, with the index. You have, it's like everything in life. It's not that there's a model good or bad. You do a most guarantee fund, you can do it terribly well or terribly bad, right? So we didn't do very well in Colombia, and we had an index which was not, which collapsed completely, which created a problem. So yes, Richard, there were good stories and bad stories, as usual in life. But my, my, our fear is, uh, what are we going to do if we do not have a fiscal, fiscal space to subsidize interest rate, right? Do you stop the system, the engine, 
or do you try to, to do something? And my point was more to say, let's not forget the lessons we learned in the past, including the bad lessons, the good lessons, to if case we need to re resume and reactivate some of the models. There is one uh, question here in, um, uh, in the chat box, and that is um, bringing us back to the real side. A uh, great point that we mentioned, of course, that if you don't bring uh, the supply side in and you only expand demand um, with finance, um, that you drive up prices. That is a very uh, key understanding. And the person here writes, uh, we see more financialization of housing assets and affordability creeping up the pyramid as well. Is housing still an asset or just um, a real site place to stay? Naim, do you want to take on that question? Happy to take that. It is a difficult one, no? <laughs> it is a very difficult one, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the, the classification in itself is, is making such a difference. Um, one of the markets that I would refer to is Indonesia in terms of regulations. Where the challenge of investing into housing, it's, it's the policy barrier that comes in because of how you classify housing. Either you classify it as an asset or you classify it as, a, as an income generation mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. And that completely changes the kind of investments that can come into this space, right? So, so I think it's a, this, this is exactly the question that we are wrestling at the policy level to say, to agree on if, if housing is asset building or housing is an income generating activity because of the, the interdependence it has with so many other functions. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's how I would look at, uh, we don't have a clear answer, but I think a lot of advocacy is required, particularly on the definition. Mm -hmm. of, of how you uh, put that into your balance sheets. Thank you. Thank you, my entire panel. Wonderful discussions. Thank you, audience. And thank you.